Thank you, Bart. Are you thirsty this morning? Well, when I use the word thirst, I could refer to a couple of different things. And the first one is physical thirst. And uh, you probably know this as an adult, you're supposed to have eight glasses of water a day. I hardly ever make that mark. Uh, now, I know somebody who really tries hard, and Dylan down here, Dylan, well, look, at, look at this water bottle. Wow. Is that like, that is a serious water bottle right there. But yeah, I, I have a hard time getting my eight glasses of water. Fact is, uh, every time I go to see my doctor, Dr. Hotmeyer, he always says, Jim, you need to drink more water and cut out your salt intake. And I tell Dr. Hotmeyer, I love salt and vinegar chips so much. It's my addiction. I have to have them. And uh, he says, well, you better drink another two extra glasses of water then. So thirst can refer to, obviously, th this kind of water right here. We all have a, a thirst for water, especially like when we're working out, we're exercising, and so forth. And uh, it's important that we have water. But there's another way you can define thirst, and that is a, a, a spiritual way. Or if you don't like that term, spiritual way, I think a, a, a being human way is every one of us, every one of us has a thirst for significance, we have a thirst for purpose, we have a thirst for worth, we have a thirst for meaning, we all have this. It's, it's, it's really, I think, a sign of being human. We have this thirst. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we satisfy that thirst? And that's a great question, which we're going to attempt to answer today. Where do we go when we're thirsty? And a lot of people, they try to quench this thirst, and sometimes it even seeps over into our lives as followers of Christ, is we find our worth in relationships, we find our worth in vocation, we find our worth in family, we might find our worth in a marriage relationship. There's all different avenues in life that we can take where we try to quench this thirst that we have. But if we're honest, oftentimes, and I would say 100% of the time, those that I just listed will never quench the thirst you really have. It's a thirst that only the Lord can satisfy. And with that, I invite you to turn to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. And in this chapter, Isaiah 55, I'm going to uh, highlight four teachings. So you'll be able to know when I'm starting and when I'm ending, because I'm going to go four teachings out of Isaiah chapter 55. And the first one, the first teaching I'm going to give you is from verses 1 and 2, and I call it the invitation or the invite. Say with me, the invite. This is an invitation that comes from the Lord himself. He's making an invitation to you and to me about having your thirst quenched. So let's look at the invitation. In my translation, it begins, I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, come, all who are thirsty. Now, the word, the idea of come, that's, that's, that's the invite. That's the invitation. And it's basically saying, hey, you there, and you there, and you there, and you there in the back row, and you there in the corner. This is an invitation for, what does it say? Some of us, a few of us. It says, all of us. All of us. It says, come, come. All of you who are thirsty. And what does it say? A call to the thirsty. It says, come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me. And eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. So here we have this invitation to come and get water, 
wine, milk, and bread. And how much does it cost? Nothing. There's an invitation here to come, come to the water, come to the wine, come to the milk, come to the bread, and it'll be the best that you've ever had, and you get it for what? Free, without cost. Here's what, this is what we call grace, right? Grace. If you admit you're thirsty before the Lord, he says, come. And I have an abundance of water, wine, milk, and bread. Drink up, eat up, and it's free. We also see, which is what, when we read Old Testament, we always need to ask ourselves this question, where do we see Jesus? Where do we see Jesus? And we ask that question because Jesus himself said we're supposed to do that. Because after his resurrection, he said, the law, the prophets, the Psalms, they speak of me. Isaiah is a prophet. So he is going to reveal to us something about Jesus if we look for Jesus. And we have to realize, I'm just going to give it, throw a figure out, that Isaiah wrote this prophecy some like, let's say roughly 700 BC. So imagine that. 700 years before the time of Christ, he wrote these words. And if you look, how Jesus said to look, you'll see him. For instance, when it comes to water, Jesus came to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, and what did he say? I'm the living water. Oh, he had a discussion uh, in John chapter 6 and said uh, that God provided by his grace manna as the children of Israel were in the wilderness. And he said, now I have come and I am the bread of life. We see in the bread and the, and the wine, we see even a foretelling of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Because he celebrated a, a Passover in the upper room with his disciples. And as he was breaking the bread and passed the cup, he said, this cup, this wine represents my blood shed for you. This bread represents my body given to you. So we see even in this, the invitation is even bigger when you consider Jesus in the picture. It's an invitation to come to Jesus, who is the living water. He is the bread of life. He is the cup and the bread, and we eat of him, and we will be satisfied. So that's the invitation. But you also notice in verse 2 that there's a warning. Did you see the warning? The warning Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? And that's the warning for us, that even as followers of Christ, we have to be careful that we don't allow something, and it can be something really good, to come between us and Jesus. Jesus is the only one who will satisfy. So we got to make sure that we just don't labor for those things. Only marriage, only family, only vocation, only a house, only marriage. You fill in the blank, whatever. Those will never satisfy. Only the Lord through the Lord Jesus Christ will be able to satisfy us. So that's, that's the first aspect. So the first teaching we see here in Isaiah 55 is the invite. The second thing is we got to ask ourselves is the how. So say with me, the how. How do we experience this water, this wine, this milk, this bread, how do we possibly experience having our thirst quenched? Well, in Isaiah 55, it'll tell us. And we're going to look at verse for this, verse 10 and 11. 10 and 11. This is the how. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, And do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty or void, but accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I was sent. So now now here's where some of you are saying, oh, I recognize that verse. The word shall not return void. How many have heard this verse? Yeah, I've heard 
Oh, it comes right here from Isaiah 55. But this is, this is the how. This is the how. Well, first of all, there's a, an illustration given. And, and how, many, how many people are farmers in here? Raise your hand, be proud. You're a farmer. You're a farmer. Lynn, raise it higher, Lynn. Come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're, we're, you're, you're a farmer. So, all right. So farmers. Farmers. Okay. So what's your role in, in planting a crop? Your, your role is what? Till up the ground, right? I'm not a farmer, so correct me if I'm wrong. You, you till up the ground, and then you plant some seeds, right? You plant some seeds, and you might put some fertilizer on it and so forth. But what does that field need that you cannot supply? You got it. Somebody said water. Absolutely right. You, you need, and then this verse says, snow and rain. And where does the snow and rain come from? It comes from the heavens, right? And again, farmers here will tell you that they plant their crops in faith, don't you? Truly. You plant your crops in faith because it's dependent upon the Lord to water the soil, to water the seed, to have the seed grow. And this is what verse 10 is saying, right? It's saying the water comes down from heaven. It's a gift. It's grace. It truly is grace. We have nothing to do with it. It's grace. It comes down, waters the field, produces the crop. You take the crop, and like you make corn, you get wheat, whatever, and you can make bread. What, what a tremendous gift, right? That's, that's just looking at nature. But then we have the next verse. The next verse, which says... So is my word, notice that though there's this connection, so is my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty. So where does the word come from? The word also comes from the Lord, and by his grace, he gives us the word. And the word is also going to produce a crop. The word is going to produce, is going to produce a crop in our lives. It's going to produce fruit in our lives. Now, there are, when you think about the word, there's two ways that we can use the word word. The first one is the word as scripture, right? The word is scripture. So we, we know that, uh, like for instance, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says all scripture is God-breathed. It's God-breathed. God breathes out his word, his scripture to us. Isn't it, isn't it a great sign of God's grace and love for us that he would actually give us his word so that we might know him and know how to relate to him, how to love him, how to love our neighbor? He gives us the word. It's not just any book. It's the book. It's the book we need to know. We need to know the scriptures. So when we see the word, the word is given us out of his, by his grace from the heavens to the writers who wrote it, and has given it to us. Now, the second way you can use the, the word, word, the word, okay? And again, we're, we're going to look at it through the lens of how Jesus said, see me. Oh, we know in John, the gospel according to John, chapter 1, that Jesus is referred to as the word. Verse 1 says, the word was with God, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And so it, the Word is also Jesus, the say our Savior. And so we look at this, this, the invite to not be thirsty, and we look at the how, the how we quench our thirst as human beings is coming to the Savior and knowing Scripture. You follow along? It's just, there's this neat, neat little pattern happening here in Isaiah 55. There's the invitation. There's the how. And now we're, now we're going to go to the third teaching I want to give it to you out of Isaiah 55. And it's the now. Everybody say it with me. The now. The now. Believe it or not, Isaiah 55 talks about the now. Well, why would it talk about the now? And where does it talk about the now? Well, it's actually in verse 6 and 7. So look at Isaiah 55. Verse 6 and 7. It says, <clears throat> Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, ways and the upright their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them 
and to our God, for he will freely pardon. So here we see the now. When are we to quench our thirst? We are to quench our thirst now. We don't wait. Now. Another trans, uh, other scriptures say, now is the day of salvation. It doesn't say tomorrow, next week, next year, 10 years from now, 50 years from now. No, it's today is the day of salvation. And I tell you what, there is a spiritual enemy. There's a spiritual enemy, the devil, who loves to whisper in our ears. And when we're confronted with a, the, the scripture, the scriptural truth, and with the Savior Jesus Christ, oftentimes says, Satan will whisper in our ears. No, you don't have to apply that now. You can, you can wait. You know, wait, wait, you know, for the young person, wait till you're older. Wait till you're older. It's, it's wait. It's the, it's the worst lie that Satan can give us is the word wait. Wait. Put it off. Put it off. Don't come to Christ today. Don't have your thirst quenched by Christ today. But today, it's the now. It's the now. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And then we see that there's actually a, a uh, teaching here about repentance. Repentance, this third teaching, repentance. And you notice what it is. It says that let the wicked forsake their ways. So there we have a what? A change in lifestyle. A change in lifestyle. So what the Lord asks us to do through the teaching of his word, he's going to ask us sometimes difficult teachings. Like Jesus will say, love those who persecute you. Love your enemies do good to all and we're saying lord are you sure about that maybe that's something i'll do a year from now but not right now so there's a change in lifestyle there's a change in lifestyle he's going to call us to do but we have to realize that the lord loves us so much that what he calls you to do is actually for your good it'll quench your thirst and will bring shalom peace into your life this is hard to imagine but it's true it's blessed you're blessed if you walk in his ways blessed so it's, we see that there's a change of lifestyle we also see and we, we we could call this actually repentance because we're turning to the lord is it talks about our thoughts it's a change in thinking a change in thinking as as anyone you know again it could be just me have any of you woken up like at three o'clock in the morning, and and uh, doesn't it, isn't it weird how you just can't like fall right asleep? But like you you might think like, wow. I don't I don't know everything that I have to do tomorrow. How am I how am I going to get this all done? And so now what I'm doing is I oh I'm starting to get just a little bit anxious. Anybody ever have that experience? Like wow, there, there's so much so much to be done. Or or you think. Um, I wonder what the outcome of this will be. I wonder what's going to happen. And then you start what? Doing, you start worrying. And boy, you put anxiety and worry together, and you're going to go right to sleep, right? Wow. I find out that I don't. Well, that's why, you know, there, there's scripture like in 1 Peter 5, 7 that says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Oh, so when those, my thinking starts getting flooded with worry and anxiety, I need to take it to the one who can quench my thirst. And by 4 o'clock, maybe I'll fall asleep. So we see that when the Lord is calling us out, we're to respond, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not next year, next, not 10 years from now, but we respond what? Now. The now. Well, my fourth teaching out of Isaiah. Oh, and this is this is a this is a fun one. This is a fun one. Wait till you see this picture up on the screen. Oh, is that a fun picture or what? Okay, now 
This, this is called the result. Everybody say with me, the result. All right. So this is the result of having our thirst quenched in Christ and his word, the Savior and scripture. There's a result. And the result, and I've been counting. I've been counting. I have heard this group already clap twice this morning. And I was almost blown away. Ebenezer has clapped twice in one morning worship service. It's like, what is happening to us? Hey, we're almost getting charismatic or something. It's like, wow, wow, this is wild. All right, but you look at these last two verses, and uh, actually Sam, before we even entered into our worship set, quoted this particular verse. But notice that, okay, so we, we have, notice this progression. We have this invite. The invite is to come, all who are thirsty, come to him. And the how is, Go to the scriptures, go to the Savior, and we see that we do that now, and then when we do that, we see that there is a result. Isn't it interesting how this works in our, in our lives? The result. For you will go out in joy. Who doesn't want to go out in joy? Huh? Right? How many want to go out in joy today? We're going to leave out here. We're going to go out in joy. Go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all of the trees of the field will clap their hands. Right, let's see if Ebenezer can clap three times today, right? So, <laughs> woo, yeah, that's the most enthusiastic clap of the day. Yes, you're getting into the scripture. That's good. All right, the trees clapping their hands. It's like this is the joy that the Lord brings about when we come to him to have our thirst quenched. This joy is not what the joy of the world can give. It's only what Christ can give. And so then we see verse 13. And this is, this is really interesting too. When we talk about the results. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. Okay, so we have two different kinds of plants, right? On the one side, we have thorn bushes and briars. How many want to go and be in a field of thorn bushes and briars, right? There's going to be sp spiky, spiny thing, thorns and everything on that. And, and yet, it's actually describing some people. I don't know, do you know any thorn bush kind of people or briar kind of people? Maybe, maybe, okay. They're prickly and ooh, you don't want to really be around them. All right, so there, but we see that in Christ, when we have our thirst quenched, in Christ in the scriptures, we become like this other group of plants, the juniper and the myrtle. Now, a thorn, br thorn bush, we would say, can never become a juniper. But in God's kingdom, yes, they can. Because when we come to him, and we have our thirst quenched through the Savior and through scriptures, he changes us from the thorn bush to the juniper. And he changes us from the briar to the myrtle. He has the ability to change us inside out. And that's what Jesus in his word does for us. He changes us. And it's also a reminder that if we're having our thirst quenched by the Savior and by scriptures, we're going to bear fruit in our lives. Fruit that cannot be ignored. We will bear fruit fruit. We will bear fruit. So, Isaiah 55, four teachings, right? Teaching number one is the invite, right? Teaching number two is the how, Savior and Scripture. The third teaching is the now, don't put off. And the fourth one is the result, you're being changed inside out, and you're bearing fruit. You don't have as many thorns on you anymore. Jesus is clipping them off. He's changing us from the inside out. So with that, um, I'm going to invite the musical team to come on up. And we have a, a song that's actually called Isaiah 55. I bet, you, I bet you, most of you have never heard this song before. Uh, I, didn't till the, I didn't really know until this week, and and I'm not the world's greatest singer either. I just happen to, you know, explore Google, Woo! you know, 
so you find these songs. So anyways, um, and you also notice that there's some tables with bottles of water. So as the team sings the song, and we obviously sing along, I'm going to invite you to a table. Invite you to a table. And there's, there's really three, three responses I'm looking at, okay? The first response might be, you've never had your thirst quenched by the Savior, Jesus Christ. You've never had that thirst quenched by him. It's quite possible you've been sitting in this church for 20 years and have not had your thirst quenched. It is quite possible. You've been putting it off that long. But now, the now, don't wait. The second aspect is you're, you've had your thirst quenched, but you want to make sure you keep on being quenched, your thirst being quenched by Jesus. And so you take a bottle just to be a reminder to you that, yep, and when you get back to your seat, pray over it, but drink some water too. Because you're supposed to have eight glasses a day. So, just thanking the Lord for changing my life, for taking me from a, a briar and a thorn brush to a, a juniper and a myrtle. You know, that's all, it's all good. And the third, and this is the most important, especially we, we just came off our missions festival, right? And we love to hear this, the stories. And Parker and Naomi, I, I saw you somewhere. I actually, there you are. Welcome. Good to see you. You know, when we think, wow, yeah, the missionaries, they, they're out there sharing Jesus and all that. But guess what? It's not just missionaries that share Jesus. If you have, you claim the name of Christ, we're all about sharing the name of Jesus. And so as you get that bottle of water, I would imagine there's somebody in your life that you know is in this Lord bush, briar patch that needs to come to Jesus. And Jesus wants to use you to communicate the scriptures and the Savior to them. So you got three good reasons to come up as the song is being played. Now, if you have a hard time moving about, have a friend nudge them and say, you go get me a bottle of water. You do that, all right? So anyways, and take that bottle of water, take a sip, and just pray along those areas I just told you about, all right? Thank you. Isaiah 55. <laughs> 